If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Lamentations. I don't think we've been in that in a while. That is the book after Jeremiah. Jeremiah is believed to be the author of Lamentations. While you're getting there, you can turn to chapter 3, but we'll look at verses throughout Lamentations. I want to mention, just remember Pastor Matt as he's coming back from being away, uh, that he would have a safe trip back. Uh, his mom, I know, did have to go through the surgery, and, uh, but just pray for him decisions about his mom's health, multiple things going on there. Also, I know Nancy Adams had to go to the hospital this past week and just remember her and that I'm sure others, whether battling COVID or whatever, if you would remember them in your prayers. As we get ready to start this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Dear Lord, this day that you have given. And we thank you, dear Lord, that we can sing hallelujah, hallelujah to our God and our King our Savior. Dear Lord, no matter what touches our life, no matter what goes on around us, we can lift up our hands in worship and give you the praise that you so richly deserve. I want to pray, dear Lord, for Pastor Matt as he's driving back, give safety to him and the family. I pray, dear Lord, uh, for those, whether it's Nancy Adams, others, dear Lord, uh, uh, dealing with health issues, that you bless them and bless your word this morning, dear Lord, as we go into it. Dear Lord, would it find a lodging place in each of our hearts. And may our lives give you the praise that you deserve. And may we live in a hope that is manifest to this world at this time. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to preach on some verses that I have written down, memorized myself, in order to deal with things that I've been facing in my life. You know, with good therapy, I'm... I really am already trained in degrees in therapy, all right? But don't come to me, all right? It's like that. And um, one of the great therapies as a Christian, when you're going through things in life, is to write down verses and uh, to not only memorize them, but just keep on uh, implanting them over and over in your mind, the truth of the Word of God. These last six months for me have been very, very difficult, all right? Um, even, you know, it's like I, I use this phrase that it seems like life will kick the hope out of you. All right. I mean, you're trying to desperately in the midst of everything going on, you hold on to hope. Last six months, I've just, you know, faced some uh, difficult times of losing a lot of people who are very, very close. All right. To me, I have a very close friend, Jim McCann, uh, and I was close to his sons because his sons grew up with my sons. All right. And it end up two of the three of his boys ended up dying within 30 days, all right? And um, having to deal, you know, with that. And then, you know, we uh, came back from the mission trip within a month. We were having a service for Jerry Sneed. And it was like, what, you know, what was going on? I, I, I've dealt with several others, but then... This past couple weeks have been really difficult. A very, very close friend of mine, all right, Ken Dolph, who's been on every mission trip I have gone, whether it's Romania, whether it's Hong Kong, whether it's China, whether it's the Caribbean, you name it. He's been there every time for like 30 years, all right? He ended up getting COVID. But this guy, he, he ended up, uh, he, he was a bodybuilder. I mean, you talk about health conscious. Man, this guy had like zero body fat, you know, unlike me, all right? I mean, just everything, all right? He got COVID. But I said, yeah, you know, he already had like three, four accidents where he had traumatic brain injury, whether a he was a daredevil, all right, whether a motorcycles or whatever. Then he also had a, a heart valve had to be replaced. He had a tumor on his pancreas that he dealt with. You know, with, um, you know, these herbs and everything else, and he conquered that. I figured, man, a lot. COVID? <laughs> He'll be out of the hospital like that, right? But it wasn't the case. In other words, I end up was informed, and he had to go to the hospital. But again, I thought, you know, but then his son called me, and, and they ended up saying that the son wasn't a lesbian trip, too, Jeremiah was saying that, um, that his dad took a uh, turn for the worse, lungs collapsed, and really oxygen level going low. And I, I was pleading 
For two mornings, I heard that God begging my God that he would spare Ken's life because we were talking right at the holidays and go on mission trip and everything else. He's, you know, when you have somebody who's always there, right, you always depend on. But it wasn't God's will, all right? Ken ended uh, going home in glory. And um, sometimes I'm saying you get in situations where it seems like it's like one blow after another, all right, of things that are going on. And Matt was doing a series, all right, that he did for a while there, redeeming the time, talking about really that in times in which we live, which we find ourselves, that we are to make full use of them to the honor and glory of God, that God is manifest in our lives and that he can work through us. We make best of the times that we have. And as I was thinking about, there's no way you can redeem the time and make most of it for our Lord unless you are living a life that displays hope, all right, no matter what goes on around you, or, all right, or in your life, that displays hope to people around you. See, if I understand the word of God that once Jesus Christ comes into our life, we are to be people of what? People of hope, am I right? That our hope is not built on, you know, necessarily events that happen in our life, but our hope is in our God, all right? And so we are to be this people of hope. So I want to look at some verses this morning out of the book of Lamentations. Let me give you a little background. Most people don't read the book of Lamentations, and the reason is it has five chapters, and there are really five funeral poems. Most people that want encouragement, I'm not going to read a funeral poem, all right? And uh, uh, it's a book of five funeral poems. Uh, it is literally a funeral dirge, all right? Uh, the book is written by uh, Jeremiah, and it's been called... Uh, uh, elegy uh, written in the graveyard, man. That's just, I mean, you listen to descriptions that people call Lamentations, you go, yeah, I want to read that book, all right? I want to get a little encouragement from it. Lamentations uh, in the Hebrew comes from a word, ekla, E-K-A-H, and that's translated, alas or how, all right? The word denotes a sense of great weeping over a sad event. Something has happened. How, that literally, Jeremiah... How could this happen? Alas, God, why did you allow this to happen? And the event that he's describing is destruction of Jerusalem and the complete defeat of the southern kingdom of Judah by the Babylonians. And he even describes it a little in the beginning of that book in Ecclesia, in uh, Lamentations uh, chapter 1, verse 15, where he says, The Lord has trampled underfoot all my mighty men in my midst. He has called an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord trampled as in a winepress, the virgin daughter of Judah. For these things I weep, my eye, my eye overflows with water. King Nebuchadnezzar began just to give you a little background on the siege of Jerusalem in 589 BC. Historically, it lasted for two years, all right? He encircled the capital of Judah, Jerusalem, and life became so bad within the city that children not only beg for bread, you can see this in chapter 2, verse 12, where Jeremiah says, they say to their mothers, the children, where is the grain as they swoon like the wounded in the streets of the city as their life is poured out in their mother's bosom. Children literally, in other words, dying in the grasp all right, of their mother, of their parents. But not only was so bad that children, all right, were ended up begging for food, but formerly compassionate mothers used their own children for food. He writes this in chapter 4, verse 10. If you can even imagine this, that how bad things have become. The hands of compassionate woman, women have cooked their own children. They became food for them in the destruction of the daughter of my people. The city, all right, was breached in 587 B.C. After two years, the Babylonians entered the city. Men and women alike were cut down by the sword. Bodies left lying, all right, in the streets. Homes destroyed. The city was completely burned and plundered, all right. Uh, the Grand Temple, Solomon's Temple, was totally destroyed. You read the description of that temple. Remember David amassed all the materials for that temple to be built. And the Babylonian soldiers stripped the bronze off the pillars and 
ransacked everything within that temple and it was burned. Uh, uh, the walls, all right, were taken down to the foundation, raised to the ground. The city was in complete ruins. Rubble was everywhere. In chapter 2, he describes it in, in verse 8. He says, the Lord has purposed to destroy the wall of the daughter of Zion. He has stretched out a line. He has not withdrawn his hand from destroying. Therefore, he has caused the rampart and the wall to lament. They languish together. The gates sunk into the ground. He has destroyed and broken their bars. He goes down in verse 13 and says, And how shall I console you? Jeremiah is saying, To what shall I liken you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What shall I compare you with that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For your ruin is a spread as wide as the sea. Most of the elite, all right, leaders of the city be taken into captivity. Again, if you're a historian, a student of history, once in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar spared no effort to humiliate, all right, uh, these that defied him. This once proud people, the Israel, all right, uh, elite, he made them march down Babylon's river road naked and chained as he would watch from the royal ship in the river that was there in that great city of Babylon. Um, Jeremiah refers to it in verse 2 of chapter 2. He says, he has brought them down to the ground. He has profaned the kingdom and its princes. There is no way I can explain to you how great the devastation was. Now, the human author of this book who is writing it is a man by the name of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. He has been an eyewitness to everything that happened. God called him to preach when he was a young man. He has been preaching to his people 40 years. Think about that. A lifetime. Warning them that this was going to happen. And he has been an eyewitness to everything that has happened. All right? And he now is believed, he's writing this book, he's sitting in a cave above, all right, the city of Jerusalem watching. He sees the smoking ruins of Jerusalem. He sees the elite being led out in chains, being taken to Babylon. The smell and probably the stench of decaying bodies is in his nose. And Jeremiah is lamenting over this great city and its people, experience the judgment of God knowing that as a tragedy of their own making. And he had warned them for 40 years this was coming. And yet he is watching all this happen. Now understand how this has affected him. The grief has taken a physical toll on Jeremiah as he's writing this. In chapter 3, verse 4, he says, He has aged my flesh and my skin and has broken my bones. Almost the same kind of picture of words that David gave when he was repenting of his sin. But it's literally that Jeremiah said, as I have seen this happen, and as I have been called for 40 years to witness to a people who would not listen, it has aged me. It has literally affected me physically, a physical toll on my body. Emotionally, in verse 7, in verse 9 of chapter 3, he says it feels like it would never end. He says, he has hedged me in so that I cannot get out. He has made my chain heavy, all right, even though he wasn't physical chains. He says, I'm changed to all these events. And he goes on and he says in verse 9, he has blocked my ways with hewn stone. He has made my paths crooked. He just, he feels like there's no way I can get out of this situation. He has no peace, no hope. Verse 17, now remember, this is a man of God who responded to the call of God and was faithful to that call no matter how he was imprisoned, tortured, and ridiculed. He was a man, all right, of faith. But in verse 17, he says, you have moved my soul far from peace. He says, I got no peace within me. I have forgotten prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. No peace. No hope. And literally what that led to, he became bitter. See, it's possible to be a Christian to be bitter over things that have happened in your life and around your life. Verse 15, he says, he has filled me with bitterness. 
He has made me drink wormwood. Spiritually, he feels like he's cut off from God. In verse 8, he says, even when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer. He feels like God's not there. All right? That his feeling is that he's forsaken and he's alone. And mentally, in verse 20, he ends up saying, I cannot escape my thoughts. He says in verse 20, my soul still remembers and sinks within me. He says, I can't forget what I have experienced. I can't forget what I saw. And as I remember it, I sink deeper and deeper into depression. All right? Anybody ever been that way? You wish you could turn your mind off? That you could unsee what you have seen, unexperienced what you have experienced? This is where Jeremiah is. And you got to remember, this is a man of God who responded and committed himself to God's call on his life. A man who remained faithful for 40 years in the midst of persecution, pain, torture, and ridicule. Yet this is where he is as he's overlooking Jerusalem. But in the midst of this, what it would look like a seamlessly hopeless situation, he ends up finding hope. And he gives us a beacon of hope when we find ourselves feeling like Jeremiah. You know, I, I wish I could say to you when you're a Christian, you're never going to end up feeling like Jeremiah. But you know what? That's not true. Sometimes you can be faithful serving God and still find yourselves in a situation similar to Jeremiah. But we do not need to give in, though, to hopelessness and despair. And that's what you see in Jeremiah. And I want to read probably what are familiar verses to you, but now you see the context. As he is remembering, as he is watching all of this, and all of a sudden he says, I can't escape my thoughts. And then in verse 21, you see these words. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And it's almost at this time very similar to the song, the last song that we sung, Jason, that you see Jeremiah now worshiping God, and he says, The Lord is my portion says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. Whoa. In the midst of that, what words did he say? Let me give you three thoughts. First one I'm going to give you is Jeremiah's decision. And that's in verse 21. He makes a decision in which, I mean, things are bleak. And he says, this I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. In the midst of Jeremiah's great sorrow, he says, I'm going to make a decision. You can either sit there and wallow, all right, in the situation, taking yourself deeper into despair, or you can choose to have hope. See, as believers, we can make that choice. And Jeremiah chooses to have hope, believing in and rejoicing in his God, even in the midst of great pain and great sorrow. See, you can have hope in sorrow and pain. And that's what Jeremiah is declaring. He decides, really what he decides, I'm going to take control of my what? Thought life. I'm going to take control of my thought life. And I was thinking about this decision to do this, and I wrote down three things. Number one, that's a difficult decision. Am I right? Because the most vulnerable place in our lives is our what? Right between these two ears, right? I I don't know if it's like you, it's our thought life, right? That's why I would tell people, you know, at church, that, you know, I would never want on a screen behind me, you see every thought that crosses my mind. You know, how you play the fool is when you say or verbalize every thought. No, you don't need to let people know everything you're thinking, right? And uh, to take control of your thought life is very difficult. To exercise control over it, it's easy to say, I'm going to do it, 
Can I say, that's a little more difficult, all right, than just saying it, all right? And this is especially true if we have allowed our minds to be consumed by destructive and unbiblical thoughts for long periods of time. See, Jeremiah, I mean, this is 40 years, right? Seeing this. And now seeing the destruction. I mean, it's literally permeated as every thought. And to say, now I'm going to take control of my thought, it's very difficult. Can I say in the world in which we live, we are bombarded, all right, with thoughts and, quote, you know, pseudo-truths based on realities that are not biblical, all right, that end up just bombard us and really get into our thought life. And for me to take control and say, I am going to think biblically on God's truth, a little tougher than it sounds. Am I right? I keep on hearing. In fact, I spoke to one of the elders of the church where I pastored up in northeast New Jersey. And they, we were sharing a prayer request that, again, one of his sons, like one of mine, just have, have turned from, you know, the faith. They're just bombarded, you know, multiple degrees and, you know, uh, end up exposed, you know, to, uh, again... <laughs> You know, unbiblical, uh, you know, atheistic, uh, you know, professors that do not believe the word of God, ridicule the truths of God's word. Those thoughts have caused them just to back away from faith. The question, as thought upon thought, has been implanted in their minds. And I'm saying it's a difficult decision, but it's a necessary decision. See, if I'm to break out of the cycle of despair and find hope, i got to make the decision I'm going to change my mindset. I have to choose. I will, what? Renew my mind. I'm going to wash my mind with the truth of God's word. That's why a familiar verse in, that Paul gives us in the New Testament, Romans 12, 2, where he says, do not be conformed to this world. I'm talking about conformed is not just in acting like this world, but thinking like this world, buying in all right, to their thoughts. Do not be conformed to it, but be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For that to happen, you got to take control of every thought that will cross your brain. All right? I mean, they're going to come. You can't stop it, right? But I can stop them in their tracks. All right? And that's what Paul, later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5 he says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Now, what are those strongholds? Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We're going to be bombarded, all right, with thoughts, beliefs that are contrary to the word of God. And we got to take responsibility to deal with those thoughts. I'm saying it's a necessary decision, but it's also a focused decision. Because a literal translation of that verse in Lamentations 3.21, where I, I'm reading now, New King James says, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Literally it says, this I will bring back to my heart. Like I said, there's a way in which we live in this world that robs the truth or takes it from our heart. And this is where Jeremiah was finding himself. And he says, I'm going to bring back this truth to my life. He says, we have to find and choose, all of us, an eternal truth to plant in our very being and then to focus on that truth every day. I have to. I have to. i got to discover what is truth. See, I personally believe this is truth. I believe my God is truth. And I need to focus on that each and every day, a truth that will give me hope no matter what comes. I was reading, and some of us that are older, you'll uh, remember this going back 1999, July 16th, all right, a member of the Kennedy family, uh, met a tragic uh, end, and that was young John Kennedy Jr. And I still remember as a young boy in high school seeing the funeral of John Kennedy and his little son, John Jr., remember, saluting the casket as it went by. 
Uh, you remember July 16, 1999. All right, at the age of 38 years, he was in a small private plane, him, himself, his wife, and his sister, and they crashed off the coast of Massachusetts, and they all died in that crash. And they were trying to find the cause of that, all right? Investigators finally, you know, concluded that he was not necessarily at fault, all right? But he flew into a situation that he was not trained to handle. What I mean by that, Kennedy was a qualified pilot, all right, John Jr., but he was only qualified as VFR, Visual Flight Regulations. That means when you're taking off in the plane, you can fly that plane as long as you're what? can see, right? You have, you have clear vision. You can see, you know, where it's uh, the horizon, where you're going. You can keep everything within focus, within perspective. But he was not qualified, all right, IFR, instrument flight regulations. Now, everything went well that day, all right, on the Atlantic coast. But all of a sudden, he was gradually, all right, encompassed, all right, by fog. And he wasn't prepared to navigate his way. And literally, when you read about this, when a pilot goes into fog, all right, or go through clouds, all right, and it blocks all visual reference points, strange as it might seem, the pilot soon loses all sense of direction. Man, I don't even have to fly in the fog, and I sometimes lose that, right? But they fly, lose all sense of direction. They don't know what's up, don't know what's down. And without an horizon... Or at lights in the distance don't even know what direction they're heading. In fact, it said they don't even know whether they're upside down or not. You have no reference point at all. And the only way to safely fly in conditions like that is to rely on your what? Your instruments. Your focus has to be on what? Those instruments. If you're focusing on what you feel, all right, or what you see, you're going to what? You, you're, going to, you're going to crash. All right? And the toughest part of, you know, earning the IFR certification, according to pilots, is learning to have that unquestionable faith in your instruments. Instrument says one thing, but you're going, I feel something else. All right? I need to do this. Can I say, isn't that true? I was thinking, isn't it true in life? I'm conditioned. I'm going to operate by sight. All right? I want to see where I'm going. I want, to, I want to know where I'm going. I want to, you know, be able to make the right moves at the right time. But sometimes in life, guess what? <laughs> I mean, we are in a cloud bank. We don't know what in the world is going on. All right? And it's at those times, all right, we need to have an unquestionable faith in the instrument panel of our life. This is it, is it not? That I, am need, I need to look to the Word of God. And I need to trust in his word. I need to trust in the word of God. And this is where Jeremiah was. He, he, he is, I mean, floundering, but he says, I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to focus, all right, on something greater, all right, than all that I see around me. Now, what was Jeremiah's truth? When he said, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. You look at verse 22 and verse 23 of Lamentations chapter 3. He says, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. He decides I'm going to look up. I'm going to look to my God. I'm going to take my eyes off of burning Jerusalem. I'm going to take my eyes off my fellow countrymen that will be let out in chains. And instead, I'm going to look to my Lord. I'm going to seek to focus on myself Feeling sorry for me, my nation, and my people, and I'm going to start thinking of my God. And notice what he focused on. I almost like these were like his instrument panel, right? The first thing he focused on in verse 22, he says, Through the Lord's what? We're not consumed. Mercy. All right? He's looking at the mercy gauge and he says, You know what? We must be okay. Mercy is the word hesed, H-E-S-E-D. And that talks about the covenant love and loyalty of God to Judah, to Israel, and to his word. 
And Jeremiah, the Holy Spirit, is ministering this thought. Even as beat down and as defeated as we are, we are not completely what? Consumed. God could have totally destroyed us. That there was not one, all right, Israelite, not one Jew left alive. But he did not utterly consume us. There is still a remnant left. There are still people left. People that are going to be left in the land. People that are going all right, into captivity. And God's mercy said no to complete annihilation. Uh, I heard this thought once where God leaves life, he leaves hope. And this is where Jeremiah was. He said, you know what? Instead of focusing on all, praise God, there's a remnant left. All right? That God is showing his mercy. But then he focuses, all right, on God's compassion. He looks at the compassion gauge and he says, it's not empty. Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. The Hebrew word for compassion is very interesting. Hebrew word for compassion comes from the word womb. A woman's womb where a child, all right, uh, ends up, uh, forms within a woman. And literally saying God's compassion is birthed out of God's love and God's mercy. That God still, see it's easy when things go on like what Jeremiah's spirit think. God doesn't care. His love is not towards us. His compassion. He's not feeling what I feel. But Jeremiah says, oh no. His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. And as bad as our situation is, it might have been worse. The tender affection of God is still alive. Even in the work of punishment, the compassion of God was not gone. Sometimes God has to correct us. Am I right? Deal with our disobedience. But aren't you glad for his compassion that he just doesn't you know, cast us away? Found this quote by Charles Spurgeon. He says this, The treasure God gives from heaven in providence and grace is the crystal fountain which wells up from an eternal depth and is always fresh and always new. We need that. And as Jeremiah considers God's mercy and God's compassion, all of a sudden things start changing. He is overwhelmed by what? The faithfulness of God. He starts saying, great is your faithfulness. Now remember, everything that's going on, right? The city, I mean, the smoke is going up. Stench in his nostrils, all right? And he is saying, great is your faithfulness. Even in Judah's catastrophe, God was faithful. Faithful in announcing the judgment, giving the people a chance to escape. He was faithful in performing what he promised. But he would also prove to be just as faithful that he was one day, and we've seen this, restored people, his people, will, back to the land in Jerusalem, and one day God's kingdom will be established. In other words, God showed him just like, you know, in, in the, when you're in the cockpit, you're going to see the horizon on that instrument to know, all right, where you are as a plane. And it's almost that Jeremiah said, you know what? It's well. It's okay. God's faithful. All right, he's going to perform what he has promised. And then he makes this declaration in verse 24. He's changed the way he's thinking. He's looking at different then he says, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. As Jeremiah remembers God's faithfulness, it's almost he's drawn back now off self, on center to God, and is in communion with God and goes from despair to hope. Now, that expression, the Lord is my portion, is based, all right, on Numbers 18.20. I don't know if you recognize that, those verses. That's when, God, when they went into the promised land and the Lord was dividing the inheritance among all the tribes. But then when it came to the tribe of Levi, the priestly tribe, they got no inheritance. 
And God said this to Aaron. Then the Lord said to Aaron, in verse 20, Numbers 18, you will have no inheritance in their land. Your inheritance is not going to be here. And he ends up saying, all right, nor shall you have any portion among them. And he says these words, I am your portion and I am your inheritance among the children of Israel. I'm your portion. I'm your inheritance. And literally, Jeremiah, you know what he's learned in saying that? My peace and my contentment is not going to be on everything that's happening, what's going on in my life, out of my life. But my portion, my contentment, is in my God. I don't need all these other things. The Lord is my portion. It's not how much is in my wallet. It's not a house. It's not a car. It's not health. The Lord is my portion. That's what he's saying. And if that is true, then that means you have a hope that never can be frustrated. Am I right? Because you, you, you can lose your health. You can lose a house. You can lose your children. You can lose friends. You can lose parents. But you can't lose your God. And that's what Jeremiah is declaring. The Lord is the portion of his people in life and in death. In time and to eternity, all he has is theirs. They are heirs of him, and they will joy him forever and ever. See, genuine faith, I was thinking about this, chooses to believe and rejoice in the midst of times that you don't understand, in the midst of trials. First Peter Chapter 1, verse 3, when Peter was writing to people under persecution, declares this. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us unto a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, as Christians, I'm not to be an optimistic person, you know. That's not what Christianity is about. See, optimism is based on what? Circumstances. I believe circumstances are going to work out a certain way and things are going to work out well for me. My hope is not built on circumstances. My hope is founded on God's faithfulness regardless of the situation. Situations don't matter to God. You understand that, right? My situation changes and my thought, emotions, everything changes. You understand that's not true with God. So I'm to stay focused on him, regardless of what my circumstances are. See, that's how you redeem. If we are going to have an effect in this world, we need to be a people who display hope. I came across this as I was studying these verses. Back in 2007, all right, the Los Angeles Times did an article, true story, on a man, and they called him, the most unlucky man in California. Listen to this, all right? Poor man, all right? His name, by the way, was uh, Larry Hanratty. Uh, he was nearly electrocuted to death. This all happened in a year, all right? On a construction site. For weeks, he was in a coma with lawyers fighting for his all right, liability claim. And to one of his lawyers during that time was disbarred. Two of his lawyers died. And his third lawyer, listen to this, ran off with his wife Why this guy's in the coma. I mean, just think about this. Then after his recovery in June, he was in a car accident. And before the police arrived at the scene, he was robbed of $55 by somebody who came along. On July 4th, his insurance company tried to stop his workers' comp claim, came within two days of being evicted from his home. By the end of July 2007, he was suffering from lupus and the start of a lung condition. He had to carry a canister of oxygen with him, taking 42 pills a day for heart condition and liver ailments. Finally, the city council came to his aid, then his friends rallied around him. After all that happened to Larry that year, he said to the mayor of Whittier, California, there's always hope, right? I mean, did a whole article on this guy. But here, this is like the Paul Harvey thing. Here's the rest of the story. Even though he was stricken in one year with what I call very bad circumstances, right? That never stopped him from doing what he did best. He was a deacon, Larry, in his church. And he was constantly helping others in times of need. 
And everywhere he went in town, you know what his nickname was? H-O-P-E. Hope. All right? Because he always told everybody, there is always hope. There is always hope. Man, should not that be our testimony? No matter what we're facing, there's always a hope because God is on the throne. When we live in a world, I mean, there's an there's a epidemic going on of really of suicide and so many things of people losing hope. As Christians, we're able to lift up our God and say, you know what? There's hope. That's how you redeem the time. That's how we affect this world. But it doesn't happen automatic. We've got to be in the midst of whatever's going on in our lives. Be like Jeremiah. I'm going to take control of my thoughts. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. I'm going to focus on God's mercy, God's compassion, God's faithfulness. He is my portion. Literally saying, God, you are enough. That's a good question to end with. Is God enough for you? What do you, what do you need? That peace, fulfillment, happiness in your life. Is it God plus what else? Or is he enough? See, if we would ever learn this thought, he is enough for now and all eternity. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around for a second. Now, I don't know what situation you're going through in your life. Like I said, that I... Last six months, I've been going through a difficult time. Uh, don't know why these situations, and I'm sure you may be in the same situation I was in. And I had determined by the grace of God, I'm not going to sit there and allow these thoughts to spiral me down, but I'm going to focus on my God. Maybe that's where you are. Man, it's just like Jeremiah, but as you feel like you're, hovering above your life and looking down, hovering upon this world and going, man, this world is going up in smoke. <laughs> I mean, just things are getting bad. And, you, and it just affects how you think, affects your hope, it affects your expectations. Maybe this morning you need to be like Jeremiah and say, you know, I'm going to change that. This I'm going to recall to my mind. I'm going to focus on my God. I'm going to declare that he is my portion. He's enough. You know, you can do that this morning, change the whole direction of your life. Can you imagine how this world would be changed if we were just a bunch of Larrys and our nickname was Hope? <laughs> that people, when they felt hopeless, would want to come around you and me so they could get some hope. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that this morning that your will would be done, dear Lord, in each of our lives. I pray, dear Lord, that we dear Lord, would be people of hope because we have a hope giver and we have a God, dear Lord, who is hope. I'm going to ask if we would all stand, heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. Maybe even at home when you're watching this message, maybe you need to bow your head and just come to the Lord and say, Lord, this day I am choosing to recall to my mind your faithfulness, your mercy, your compassion. And I'm going to declare that you are enough, that you are my portion. Maybe you're here this morning and you just need to bow at this altar and just tell God, you know, in the midst of what's going on in my life, you're enough and I love you. Remember that song that we sung at the end when it said hallelujah? Sometimes God just wants us in the midst of a burning world, just lift up our hands and say hallelujah. We have an omnipotent God who is in total control. Maybe you need to do that this morning. Whatever God has laid upon your heart as the team has ended up playing this first uh, of praise, if you need to come to this altar, we invite you to come at this time.